welcome to uh, the McGill Transport uh, Seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor, and uh, I can't say how happy I am to have Professor Julian uh, Adjaman with us today. And Julian is like a, is a dear friend, and he always inspires us with his talks. And uh, if you haven't read any of his books, then you're missing a lot. If you haven't read his last paper, uh, that was published recently, I think in JAPA, right? Uh, it's amazing, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a must read for all uh, planners. Uh, thank you, Julian, for coming. And uh, please go ahead and start sharing your screen. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was um, a, a visiting professor at uh, McGill uh, a few years ago and uh, thoroughly enjoyed my time in uh, in Montreal and uh, Ahmed was uh, was part of that. So I'm going to talk about just sustainability in urban planning and practice. I will talk a little bit about transportation but I want you to take a step back from transportation to think about the bigger context and about the need for just and sustainable communities and I hope uh, this will uh, inspire you to think more broadly perhaps about issues of equity and social justice. Um, I want to um, acknowledge that I'm presenting to you from the traditional territories of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people, and I want to pay my respects to their elders, their past, present and future, and commit to a principle of care and respect as part of this meeting. So let me give you a little bit of history about just sustainability. Uh, if you were to go out onto the streets of Montreal and ask 10 people what sustainability is, nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 would say it's about the environment. But I want to suggest it's more than that. We could legislate for a green city, but if that city wasn't um, equitable and just, would it really be what we could call sustainable? Would it be the highest uh, accolade that we could give a sustainable community. This book, um, which was written now 18 years ago, was the first book really to try and disrupt that environmental sustainability discourse and to focus explicitly on equity and justice, on the links between environmental quality and human equality. And it didn't do it as some books do through one chapter, you know, the one chapter on equity and justice. This book looked in every single chapter, every author of the edited collection was asked to look at their uh, narrative through the lens of equity and social justice. And in this book, we argued that sustainability cannot simply be a green or environmental concern, important though these environmental aspects of sustainability are, we argued that a truly sustainable society is one where wider questions of social needs and welfare and economic opportunity are integrally related to uh, environmental limits imposed by supporting ecosystems. Now, I don't usually advertise other people's books, but if you haven't read this, you should. In this book, The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone, two British researchers, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, uh, go through 40 years of quantitative data from across the world. And the conclusion they come to is this very simple it is not poverty but inequality that is the real corrosive force in our society and they found that countries with the biggest gap between rich and poor were also the countries that had the most social problems from incarceration to uh, school failure to uh, malfunctioning uh, health systems to domestic violence, to drug abuse, on every single social malaise, inequality deepened the problem. What was also interesting was that they did something quite unique. They looked at advertising revenues and found that countries with the bigger gap between rich and poor also had, also had the highest advertising revenues. What do we conclude from that? Advertisers love inequality because inequality makes people spend money. And as I highlighted in yellow on my slide, inequality heightens competitive consumption. This was from their conclusion. What does that do? What it means is that people in the lowest class are buying to try and get into the next, to the next, to the next. Even the rich are trying to get into the super rich. So 
inequality drives consumption. It heightens competitive consumption. Sometimes we call it keeping up with the Joneses. But what does competitive consumption also do is it drives our carbon footprint. Countries with a bigger gap between rich and poor tend to have higher carbon outputs. That's a really interesting idea because whenever I hear people talk about climate change, they talk about, oh, we need sustainable transportation. We need sustainable agriculture. Yeah, we do. We absolutely do. But the driver or one of the big drivers of climate change is inequality, the consumption driven desire to get into the next class, to get ahead. So if we really want to understand sustainability, I think we should focus on both human equality and environmental quality together. How often do Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, these environmental quality based groups, how often do they talk to social justice based groups or human rights groups like Amnesty International? And just to leave this little section uh, of my talk, think about wherever environmental degradation is happening in the world, whether it's the Amazon, the Congo rainforest, the Niger Delta, the Kamchatka Peninsula. Environmental degradation is always happening where there are human rights and social injustice abuses happening. They seem to go together. So there is a link between environmental degradation and human uh, issues of equality and rights. So how am I going to define just sustainability? It's about the need to ensure a better quality of life for all now and into the future in a just and equitable manner while living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. So don't think this is simply about social justice. It's about social justice within ecosystem limits. Four conditions. We must commit nationally, locally, internationally to improving people's quality of life and well-being. We must meet the needs of both the present and future generations. Many sustainability definitions talk about future generations. I want us to talk about current generations. We need to talk about justice and equity in terms of recognition, process, procedure and outcome. Recognition, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, the calls for First Nations reconciliation and recognition. And then we need to do all one, two and three within four, within the ecosystem limits, one planet living. There is no planet B, there is no waste pipe and resource pipe uh, leaving this planet and coming back from another planet with fresh resources. This is what we've got. We have to do just sustainabilities within that uh, parameter. Now, three thoughts on urban planning. Um, the best definition very simple that I know is Patsy Healy, Emeritus Professor of uh, Urban Planning at Newcastle University in the UK. And she says, urban planning is managing our coexistence in shared space. Great. Leonie Sandercock at UBC adds that this speaks with equal clarity, whether we're talking about environmental, transport, housing or other conflicts. But it reminds us that whether we like it or not, we're not sharing this space. We're not coexisting in space with identical people. We are living in cities of difference, where difference and diversity are becoming the defining factors of our cities. And we need to find ways to coexist in these spaces from the next door neighbor to the street, to the neighborhood, the city and the region. The second thought that is uh, really uh, exciting and <laughs> making me use a lot of brain power at the moment is what is the relationship between belonging and becoming? As urban planners, we are very good about vision, about what cities can become. And we must never stop being that. That's what defines urban planning. It's about what is possible. But what we've forgotten, I think, a lot is who gets to belong in that city of becoming? Who gets to belong in terms of who do we recognize as having rights to the city? Are we good at reconciliation? Can we recognize difference, diversity and inclusion? My argument is that a just sustainabilities approach seeks to balance what the city can become with who can belong, because ultimately what our cities can become will be a product of who is allowed to belong in those cities. And then finally, I just want to take a little pot shot that the uh, New Urbanists, Congress for New Urbanism, 
it's not about human scaled planning, it's about humane scaled planning. I want you to start putting an E on human and I want you to talk about humane scale planning for reasons that'll become obvious as I go through my talk. So I think just sustainability helps us think about coexistence and shared space. It helps us think about who gets to belong and what we can become. And it helps us to shift the debate from human scale planning to humane scaled planning. I'm gonna give three examples. I'm gonna talk a bit about spatial justice. How do we allocate rights in urban spaces and places? I'm gonna talk second about Minneapolis, very topical. How does one of the most green liberal cities in the US end up as the epicenter of our US and global current introspection over structural racism? And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my work in food justice. And I'm gonna ask you, what is local food? This obsession with local food in intercultural societies. So let me start with spatial justice. You don't have any cities in Canada, we don't have any cities in the US that have walls separating populations, but they do in Jerusalem, in Nicosia, between the Greeks and the Turks, in Cyprus, and in Belfast in Northern Ireland, there used to be a dividing wall. And as David Lammy, the British Member of Parliament said, social justice requires that life chances aren't distributed along class lines, spatial justice, justice across space requires that they are not distributed geographically yet in the US and maybe to a lesser extent but maybe maybe uh, in Canada as well in the US there are freeways there are railways there are rivers and we know that on one side of that freeway railway or river they live and on the other side you live and your life chances your life opportunities are much better in the US your zip code is more important than your genetic code for determining your lifespan and life opportunities. That's spatial injustice. Fortunately, uh, as a geographer who didn't benefit from the GIS revolution, because I graduated in 1980, geography has given us the greatest thing since the map in GIS. So let's bring this down to the street level. The street is the urban space that we all use most, uh, and it's one that we use pre-COVID every single day. Here's two streets. Uh, on the right, Massachusetts Avenue. On the left, Sodrevegan in Gothenburg. Both identical width, but they couldn't be more spatially different in their organization. The Swedes have done what I call street democratization. They have upended the American principle, the US principle that you can see on the right, which is basically whoever has the bigger vehicle gets the right to public space. And they've democratized that space such that the streetcar, the active transportation, pedestrian, cyclists have equal access to the public part of the street. To the left of the streetcar is the only part of that space that is uh, for private vehicles. You're a kid growing up on Sodrevegan or you're a kid growing up on Massachusetts Avenue. I don't have an answer to this question, but how are those kids wired differently? How are their brains wired differently growing up on one of these two streets where one, they see democracy in action through urban planning. The other, they see, uh, you know, a little bit more chaotic scene. How does that affect kids' brains? Now we have data on this. Uh, this is the data from Apple Yard in the early 80s, did his work in the late 70s in San Francisco, and he looked at three streets, heavily trafficked, moderate and light. And you can see immediately that lightly trafficked streets have much more social interaction than do heavily trafficked streets. So what's the just sustainability's take on this? Who lives in neighborhoods with heavily trafficked streets? One of the characteristics of environmental justice or just sustainability is that if you look at neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods, people of color neighborhoods, they have much less traffic calming, much heavier traffic on streets. And we know that car traffic decreases social interaction. And I'm gonna come back to talk a little bit more about the lightly trafficked street or the traffic calmed street or what we call in the US complete streets. Spatial justice is more than just bike lanes. So there's an obsession 
with you transportation planners uh, on physical infrastructure. That's good, we need physical infrastructure, but I would also add we need to think about what we might call socio-cultural infrastructures. For instance, um, why is it that black cyclists, cyclists of colour, are 25, uh, sorry, are much more likely to be given citations, uh, whether it's in Tampa Bay, as my evidence here shows, whether it's in Houston, Texas, whether it's in Chicago, across the US, black cyclists are much more likely to get a citation. This will not be helped by bike lanes. This is because the policing of black and brown bodies as they move through urban spaces is something that we really need to talk about. Now, why do I call these invisible cyclists? Well, most in the US, most cycle counts are click, 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 no record of gender or race, and the cycle counts largely take place in the central business districts, the downtowns. I call them invisible cyclists because these people are not recorded. They are cycling in the neighborhoods where the cycle counts aren't taking place. And so we estimate in the US and um, other surveys have shown that some of the greatest numbers of increasing cyclists have been amongst cyclists of color. And this was data from uh, 2013. So who knows what it is now? Plus in those neighborhoods, uh, as we've talked about, the fatality rates are higher because those roads are more busy, there's more big trucks, there's more traffic. 23% higher fatality rates amongst Latinos, 30% amongst African Americans generally across the US. So bike advocacy groups don't just think about physical infrastructure, that's important, but we do also need to think about what I call socio-cultural infrastructure, the policing of black and brown bodies uh, in urban spaces. Now, it's not all bad news, there's some good news. Um, Bloomberg, Janet Sadiq Khan, Jan Gale, all of those uh, transportation justice groups in New York really pushed a policy agenda that moved us to where the bottom right picture is now, which is Broadway outside of Macy's. This tells me uh, good urban planning is about what is possible. This is where becoming and dreaming are important. We do need to think about what is possible. If we keep doing the same things, then we'll just keep, keep in the same tired old paradigm. We need to think about urban planning as what is possible. And who'd have ever thought that this would be possible uh, in New York City, a people street. Now I mentioned about how good we are at stopping people from belonging. Well, here's some examples. Top left, we, sh we stop teenage skateboarders from doing edges. We uh, try to stop homeless people sleeping on benches by putting uh, armrests. We put those horrifically egregious studs uh, a lot on buildings where people are just trying to get a little bit of warmth and a bit of shelter from the rain or snow. And we put studs there like we put uh, spikes to stop pigeons. The bottom right, uh, again, egregious. Um, and I don't know whether you have this in Montreal, but we do in London, we do in, uh, in New York City, um, where a developer has to put in some moderate to low income uh, in, a, in a new development in many cities, some of them have developed a poor door, rich door policy. So the poor, the low income, the moderate income people have to go to their apartments on the lower levels through the back alley, whereas the rich get to uh, drive their cars, uh, valet park them, and then they go in the high speed elevators up to their penthouse apartments through the rich doors uh, on, the, on the main road. Horrible, horrible. This is what's called hostile and defensive architecture. And I, almost think that we, we should sign a pledge, a do no harm pledge, just as, uh, just as uh, medical doctors do. A do no harm pledge as urban planners and architects, uh, and we should not participate in this kind of, uh, uh, this, this inhumane treatment. Bottom left is a bridge under which there were a lot of homeless people in Seattle. So the city of Seattle decided, hey, what can we do? Let's put some bike racks under the bridge to stop homeless people sleeping there. Now, thankfully, the good cycle community of uh, Seattle said, hey, whoa, 
do not use cycle infrastructure, sustainability infrastructure to try and fix a problem which demands a policy solution. We don't want our um, infrastructure associated with this. One idea about mixing uh, in the urban environment is the concept of the cosmopolitan canopy. And uh, the picture on this book uh, is of the um, Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia. Elijah Anderson, my friend, talks about how, for the most part, we walk along streets trying to maintain lack of eye contact, but there are certain spaces in cities, and he calls them cosmopolitan canopies, where we let down our guard, where we are human, where we are humane, where we are civil to each other. Often these are food spaces, they're spaces where people will sit and uh, chew on a Philly cheesesteak while watching, or, or Greek uh, gyros, while watching uh, a ball game. How do we create? Is there a role for us as urban planners, urban designers, in creating cosmopolitan canopies? Now, let me just say this. They won't end racism, but there is a theory called contact theory, and that theory is the more contact we have with people who are different to us, outside work contexts, in leisure contexts, the more likely we are to develop uh, empathy and an understanding of diversity and difference and support policies which further that. So think about that. Is there a role for planners and urban designers in creating these cosmopolitan canopies, these spaces of human engagement? I told you I'd mentioned complete streets. Um, the whole complete streets movement, and you have it in Canada as well, it might be called livable streets, I, I can't remember what it's called in Canada, but the idea here is to decenter the automobile as the main user of streets and to recenter alternative transportation methods. Here's a few examples from Massachusetts, on the right one from Toronto, every town and city in the US uh, has these, uh, these, these design guides. Now, one thing that's interesting though, on the bottom right, there's a complete street design, cookie cutter design. Doreen Massey, the late great geographer Doreen Massey said places, and I see streets as places, as having no meaning, but they are constantly shifting articulations of social relations through time. Try telling that to our physically oriented urban designers. Urban designers don't seem to understand the sociology, the ecology of the street as a human space as well as a physical space, because much of the complete streets rhetoric effectively disconnects streets from their significant social, structural, symbolic, discursive and historical realities. So the picture on the bottom left, you can't design that or plan it. That happens as a result of social interactions, shifting narratives and articulations. Would you believe Los Angeles, the motor metropolis, has a complete streets policy, but get this, until very recently they banned um, street vendors. Now, anybody who knows LA, there are two huge great social groups, uh, cultural groups, South Asians, Southeast Asians and Latinx communities. What is one of their cultural forces, tour de force, is street vending, street food. How can you have a complete streets policy? Who gets to say what a complete streets policy is if it denies a cultural expression from groups who do this and who make the street a social space in doing this? Now, happy to say that now LA has unbanned and he's permitting uh, street vending, but not because of the complete streets argument, just because they want to protect them from President Trump's um, enforcement, because many of these are undocumented people. So the city uh, went along with that. One of the problems we notice with complete streets is what's called green lining. So some of you might know that um, 50, 100 years ago, uh, 70 years ago, there was uh, a huge, um, uh, well, it wasn't a controversy at the time, it's become a controversy with redlining. The idea that government and private sector uh, agencies would draw red lines around a map, 
depending on who lived in those neighborhoods. And redlining effectively stopped any investment in the neighborhood. Uh, this was directly and explicitly racist. What we're noticing though in the US is that these green complete streets, these sustainable neighborhoods, or this green lining is having a similar effect to redlining. It's not racist, but it's a socioeconomic exercise in that it costs a lot of money to buy or rent in these traffic calmed, rather nice green neighborhoods. And so one argument that we're putting forward is that if we're not careful, this complete streets movement will systematically reproduce the urban, spatial and social inequalities and injustices that have characterized our cities for the last century or more. And just to drive this point home, um, the key measurable, one of the key urban sustainability metrics is walkability. You, we would all agree with that. And of course, there's an app for walkability and it's called WalkScore. Who owns the app? It's Redfin, the realty company. So let's just pause here. We have commodified sustainability to the point that a realty company, one of the world's biggest realty companies, owns the app for the key measurable for urban sustainability, which is walkability. Let that sink in. We have commodified sustainability. We have compromised sustainability. Um, just a little bit about urban parks. Thinking about urban parks as public spaces, um, one of the key books that I think is, is really important here is this one, Rethinking Urban Parks, Public Space and Cultural Diversity, not biodiversity, cultural diversity. The argument is that the way we design and manage, and I would argue program parks, can exclude some people and reduce social and cultural diversity. And I wanna put a proposition to you here. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. And when you think about it, the design, the management and the programming of parks is often done by people who don't come from the community, who don't look like the community, who don't think like the community. There's a great opportunity here for what I would call co-production. Can we co-produce designs, management schemes and programming schemes that reflect the community? A great opportunity here for the progressive, visionary parks department to think, how do we involve the community in a co-production process? So I want you to think about that. And I want you to think more broadly about this idea of representation. Does your organization, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a government department, planning, parks, transportation, does it look like or have any representatives from the community? Does your advocacy organization uh, have that? Great paper came out 16 years ago called Immigrant Engagement in Public Open Space, Strategies for the New Boston. And they make this very important point that we have all of these friends of the park organizations, you know, friends of organizations. And usually they are individuals who are very empowered, often very rich, always very white. What happens when these groups come up against a changing city like Boston that is now majority minority where the city council in years to come may not see things the same way as these friends of the park organizations. Again, this is about this, this notion of representation, about belonging, who gets to become engaged. Now, one of the things that's interesting about looking at immigrants and public space in Boston, certainly, is that people gravitate to spaces that are familiar. I think one of the reasons that that place is so popular with us Latinos is because of the willows. Willows in Guatemala are very common. They grow beside rivers. People like Herta Park in Boston because it looks like home. I'm gonna give you lots of examples about how immigrants bring home with them, often mentally, but also physically, in that they are attracted to landscape or cityscape features which are reminiscent of home. In Copenhagen, they tried a different tack. They've done what I call designing in encounter. And in Superkeelan Park, which is a linear park with a cycleway going through it, this is Copenhagen after all, uh, they ask the local community, very diverse, very different community from Russia, Ghana, Mexico, Spain, all over the world, 
they said, what do you want in this space? And people said, <clears throat> we would like artifacts from our countries of origin. That's what we want. And so this space, and if you ever get a chance to go to Copenhagen as I have, it's an amazing place. Uh, I went when it was raining, it was nice and sunny in those pictures, but it's an example of how um, a landscape design firm effectively co-produced this space with the local community. So I want you to think about this idea of co-production, blurring the boundary between designer and user, between producer and user, between service provider and service user. Co-production is, I think, something that we have to think about if we want to deepen people's involvement in public space. I want to give a special shout out to my good friends at the University of Sheffield in the UK in the Department of Landscape who run the Transnational Urban Outdoors Research Group. They produced uh, some excellent materials, refugees welcome in parks. A lot of evidence shows that the trauma that refugees uh, have suffered is alleviated with public space. How do we um, integrate refugees? How do we help their well-being in public spaces? They published a great um, piece in the journal that I'm an editor of, Local Environment, called Ethnographic Understandings of Ethnically Diverse Neighbourhoods to Inform Urban Design Practice. We know what uh, different groups want. That doesn't stop us needing to talk to them as individuals, but you know, I do urge you go and find that paper. If you can't find it, uh, I'll send you a copy of it. But the, the point here is we need to move away from design charrettes to deep ethnographies. We need deep ethnographic understandings of communities. We don't just need the demographic um, percentages, you know, 70% Latino, 20% African American, etc. We need to go deeper and understand the ethnographic uh, makeup of communities, what their foodways are, what their uh, recreation preferences are, etc. and etc. My second uh, example that I wanted to talk about was Minneapolis. And remember back at the beginning, I said, you know, if we went, if we asked people on the streets of Montreal what uh, sustainability is, and they most of them would say, well, it's about the environment. Well, you know, on on the surface, Minneapolis is a green utopia. It's an absolute green utopia. Best park system in the US, 10 years running, according to the Trust for Public Land. One of the best cities in the US for exercise. It's got the third most bike commuters after Portland, Washington, DC. And uh, it's also affordable. It's got opportunity. It's got wealth. So what's wrong so minneapolis is a green utopia if you're white uh, if you're not white it's not so much fun uh, racial inequality in minneapolis is the worst in the nation uh, the black white income gap that's wages is the highest except for milwaukee the home ownership gap the so-called wealth gap is the highest bar none and the um, so-called achievement gap, but more, I think, correctly called the opportunity gap at K through 12 education is hugely um, out of favour with African-American especially, but also Native American uh, students. So I was going to call this slide Minneapolis WTF, but I thought, no, you're, you're too nice to use word phrases like that. So I'm just going to call it Minneapolis Y. Um, and I do urge you to go and visit some of these sites. There's a site called Mapping Prejudice, and Kirsten Delagarde is a Minneapolis historian and founder of the site. And she said all that rhetoric, that civic rhetoric about Minneapolis being a model metropolis at the cutting edge of great urban planning obscures darker truths about the city. So what are those darker truths? Well, until the early 1900s, Minneapolis was actually an integrated city. There was a small but well-integrated African-American population. And then something happened in the early 1900s. We got the development of racialized covenants. This house shall not be sold or rented to anybody other than members of the Caucasian race. No Negroid, Mongoloid, Oriental, Turkish, you know, they go through the list horrifically racist language, 
But these racialized covenants existed from the early 1900s to the 1960s, and they still unofficially exist today. They're illegal, but that doesn't stop them happening. So we had racialized covenants until 1917 in the United States when it was struck down by the Supreme Court, explicitly racialized zoning was okay. And then it was struck down by the Supreme Court. And racism and racists are very clever. And so they thought, well, what do we do to maintain this white supremacy in these neighborhoods? Well, we'll change it to single family zoning. Racism by the back door, because as we know, single family zoning effectively prices out lower income and minority people. And 70% of residential land uh, in Minneapolis is single family zoned compared to say, 15% in New York. This is called exclusionary zoning. And then if that's not enough, uh, we had redlining. Uh, and again, I explained this was drawing red lines on a map in neighborhoods that were gonna be starved of funds. So the neighborhoods went into decay. There is no coincidence that today these neighborhoods are food deserts. They are environmental justice zones. Um, you know, it's another lecture, but food deserts have nothing to do with the present day. It's all about this history of racist zoning. So racialized covenants, single family zoning, redlining equals racial segregation then and now. Nobody except the South Africans with apartheid and pass laws has done it better than the US. Nobody, bar none. We've done it very, very, very well. So what is the city, of, what, what is Minneapolis doing about it? Well, the uh, former director of long range planning said there's a direct link between those practices in the late 19th and early 20th century and today's modern zoning plans. Part of the impetus for changing how we view land use is to try to undo those impacts. I put it another way, I think much more simple, Urban planning is the spatial toolkit for articulating, implementing and maintaining white supremacy, and we can do something about it. What are they doing about it? Now, as I said at the beginning, Minneapolis is a paradox. It's a green liberal city. It's one of the most liberal cities in the US. So why is it the epicenter of this great racial reckoning that we're going through in the US? So, the Minneapolis 2040 plan um, has, I think, some very visionary uh, ideas. The first thing they did was to uh, become the first US city in 2018 to uh, vote to uh, erase family, uh, single family zoning, now allowing duplexes and triplexes on what were single family lots. Uh, they've got inclusionary zoning packages, not too impressive. We're much more impressive in Massachusetts in terms of the percentage of units, but 10% is a start for low to moderate income households as part of, uh, I can't remember what the, um, the minimum size of the building has to be to have inclusionary zoning requirements. But the, uh, the goal number one of Minneapolis 2040, I think bears mentioning, Eliminate disparities, period. In 2040, Minneapolis will see all communities fully thrive regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, country of origin, religion, or zip code, having eliminated deep-rooted disparities in wealth, opportunity, housing, safety, and health. So just like Portland, Portland, Oregon's very similar. Super green, but scratch the surface, and this racist inheritance of zoning and segregation comes to the fore. Minneapolis and Portland are very similar in that they've both got very progressive democratic administrations that are now trying to do something about this toxic racist legacy. And finishing up, I wanna talk a, a bit about um, food justice. Uh, any of you are interested, this is my book, Cultivating Food Justice, Race, Class and Sustainability. But I want to go back to this question that I asked you right at the beginning. What are local foods in intercultural societies? So let me start by telling you a story. Uh, 2011, I was last listening to uh, National Public Radio, <clears throat> and the story was about George and Julia Bowling, who run the bowling farm in Maryland. Uh, Maryland um, has a lot of tobacco farmers, and the state is trying to get <clears throat> people out of tobacco farming and into uh, 
more diverse forms of uh, production. So George and Julia being good American entrepreneurs scratch their heads and think, what, what are we gonna start selling? And then somebody said, you know that there's 120,000 Africans in DC and they want to eat African food, locally grown African food. Um, they don't want it flown in, they want you know, to come to pick and buy places. And so now the signboard outside the bowling farm doesn't say tobacco, it says African produce. The African community, the bowlings, worked with the University of Maryland Extension Service and they produced a really useful resource pack on what African crops will grow in Maryland, how to grow them, what recipes you can make with them. This is entrepreneurialism. This is entrepreneurialism. But I come back to what is local food in an intercultural society? Here in Massachusetts, people will tell you, oh, it's what's what should be grown in Massachusetts. You know, well, what do you mean should? And what is local anyway? I'm a geographer. There is no such thing as local. There's no signboard, you know, when you get five miles out of Montreal saying, well, you are now leaving local and approaching something else. There is no such thing. It's a relative term. And so what I'm thinking and hearing here is that the Africans see local less as a geographic concept, more as a cultural concept. They want their food grown locally. And I'm going to come back to that. So the Filipinos in San Diego have similar ideas. When asked by a PhD researcher, what do you consider local food? They said, well, it's the food we eat in our restaurants. It's the stuff we grow in our yards. She evolved this notion of translocal identities. Remember the Guatemalan and the Willows? Remember the Africans in D.C.? The Filipinos in San Diego are no different. They bring with them local, um, a local identity, whether it's a physical identity of where they want to sit by the river or whether it's the food that they want to eat. Uh, I have to put in a Canadian example here. How many of you know that in the Metro Vancouver area, nearly 20% of farmers are Chinese Canadians? nearly 20% of farmers. And because of a history of anti-Chinese racism in Canada, together with the, the, the kind of Chinese Canadian farmer um, entrepreneurialism, these farmers don't use the traditional farmers markets. They've set up their own network of farm stands, roadside stands. And if, so if you think about it here, I've just challenged two of the key um, features, fixtures of the alternative food movement. I've challenged the concept of local and now I'm challenging the fixity of the farmer's market because the Chinese have created their own. And I gave this talk in 2011 in Vancouver and a woman from Kenya put a hand up. She said, I've just moved to Vancouver and I only shop at the Chinese Canadian farmer's markets because they grow the food I want to eat. Just putting out there the things that we need to think about as urban planners, as food planners, as food justice advocates, about what issues are of equity within urban environments and access to food in a sense. And the final example on this, um, very sad, 2006 um, South Central Farms LA, the biggest urban farm in, in the United States, 96% uh, Latinx, was uh, bulldozed. Um, and these two women uh, in their garden in the farm, um, they show several things. Number one, they show culturally appropriate crops, but they're also grown in a replica of their garden in Oaxaca. <clears throat> and, and I always get a chill down my spine when I read their transcript. I planted this garden because it's a little space like home. We grow the same plants that I had back in my garden in Oaxaca. We can eat like we ate at home and this makes us feel like ourselves. It allows us to keep a part of who we are after coming to the United States. The Guatemalan and the willows, the Africans and their food uh, grown in Maryland, the Oaxacans growing food in South Central, um, the Canadian, Chinese Canadians, Everybody has a different take on locality, on space and place. Who are we to say that's not right, or you've got to do this, or local is this? 
we need much more reflexivity. Similarly, in the US, we have a, a, a string of 50 refugee farms. My own university, Tufts University, runs one in Lowell, Massachusetts, just uh, in the metro, Boston metro area. But these farms are for immigrants, and this is New Roots Farm in um, San Diego. These are for immigrants uh, to get a first footing in US agriculture. These are people who uh, want to become farmers, agriculturalists, and they are people who uh, also bring new skills for traditional farmers to learn. So again, there's a, there's a kind of an iterative process here. And my final um, slide, just want to advertise my latest book, uh, The Immigrant Food Nexus, um, Borders, Labour and Identity in North America. There are three chapters on, on Canada. That's why we call this book uh, North America rather than the US. But it's just a really interesting book on how important immigrants are in the US food supply. 50 to 70 percent of people, workers in the food chain between the factory, uh, between the fields and the restaurants are undocumented. But also how uh, important food is to immigrants, especially in our xenophobic United States. The food ways, the traditions that people um, have evolved around food are super important at keeping communities together, keeping them sane in these, in these crazy times. So let me just summarize just sustainability in urban planning and practice. We need to think about how we manage our coexistence in shared space. And I might even replace the word manage by celebrate or mainstream. How do we mainstream our coexistence in shared space? We really do need to think about what cities can become. We need to keep dreaming. But we also need to think about who gets to belong in our cities with the conviction that what our cities can become will only be as good as who gets to belong. Do we want elite belonging uh, becomings? Do we want elite notions of what the city is? Because then let's keep gentrifying, let's keep excluding, let's keep uh, forcing people out. And we will have those elite imaginings of what the city can become. We need to become better at fostering engagement and belonging using deep ethnographies. Imagine if the city of Montreal worked with communities to develop deep ethnographic profiles of communities, co-producing them with communities, very important. We need to engage in intercultural, culturally competent planning and policy. We need to practice humane scaled and human scaled urban planning and design. And my final point, above all, social justice never simply happens in planning processes and outcomes. It must be intentional, implicit and front and centre in our work. Never ever have I seen a plan or a policy that was geared around technical, economic or environmental uh, concerns. Never have I seen it reap rewards in terms of social justice and equality. It only happens if you centre social justice and equity within your, uh, within your policy and planning framework. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, every time I listen to a talk uh, from you, I always have end up with a list of a lot of books and things I have to read. So my <laughs> is increasing every time I uh, I listen to something. So thank you so much for the for the talk and for uh, uh, this. I'm gonna start with uh, some like high level planning and uh, questions and belonging that one of the some of the students are asked. So I have two students, uh, Claire and uh, Connor, uh, are asking about, um, do you have any suggestion as how planning departments can be better at reaching out to minority immigrant communities and get them engaged in the planning process? How can planners be sure to do no harm uh, and not to reproduce inequalities from the environment? It's a loaded question. Yeah, totally. And, and it, it's a, a great question. Um, look, we in our department at UEP, um, we have over 50, we have a faculty of 14, over 50% women. Um, a third of our faculty are faculty of colour. 
um, we find it hard to attract minority students. Why? Because Tufts University is private and it's expensive. And we do get minority applicants. They like the fact that they see themselves in the faculty, but somebody else is giving them a free ride. Universe, um, city planning departments um, are never the most diverse places on, on the planet. Um, one problem with the word outreach, I, I would be careful about using that word outreach because outreach usually, I mean, it can be critiqued from a sort of settler colonial uh, lens that it is a, a, a colonizing kind of concept, outreach to the local community. Um, when in reach <laughs> maybe is a, is a better concept, how can the local community in reach to you as urban planners? Now, look, we're all in the same position here. <clears throat> we all know that we need to diversify the profession. But the first thing that we can do, though, before maybe we before we do that, um, is to at least ensure that we are culturally competent. My research in the US has shown that no planning school that is accredited has a course on cultural competency. Yet urban health professionals, social workers, other urban professionals have cultural competency in their code of practice as one of the, you know, as one of the things that they're assessed on. And the health professions go even further. They make the point that um, culturally competent healthcare is associated with better health outcomes. Well, I put this to you. Culturally competent urban planning should probably be associated with better urban planning outcomes. So I'm going way around the way that you're asking this very good question. But number one, if, you're, if you don't look like the community, at least become culturally competent so that you understand who the community is. Number two, deep ethnographies. Don't just say, oh, we need somebody who can speak Haitian or whatever. We need deep ethnographies. We need to understand these communities. And I think this combination of cultural competency and deep ethnography can help us go a long way. But we do need to look at the pipeline issues. How do we develop pipelines from these communities to schools like McGill so that we can get uh, urban planners who look like the community? Leave you with one point. If you go to uh, dsni.org, it's a non-profit in Boston, the Dudley Street Neighbourhood Initiative. In 1980, they set themselves up. This was a great period of... Um, you know, of devastation of the urban environment, you know, blocks were just literally uh, empty. They did a demographic survey of the neighbourhood and they constituted their board of directors to look like the community. They are seen as legitimate, they are trusted, they are still the only non-profit in, in the US to ever have been given eminent domain status. They've developed city farms on their community land trust land, they've developed X, five, 700 uh, affordable housing units, and the funders love them. Your community, your organizations should try and look like the communities they're serving. I, 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 I wanna hear from, from you, that's a personal question, that's a personal for me. What are your thoughts about COVID and what's happening now in terms of the, uh, the inequalities that COVID has highlighted? To us, and how we, we like we see some of the streets being opened, but in many cases they're opened in uh, like where are they opened, or what have you observed? I need I need to 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 dig in your your mind a little bit about your opinion about COVID. Well, you know, look, um, how have the planners reacted? There's look, this this this. Well, there's two two aspects here. I mean, one is. For many of us who've been talking about inequality in urban planning for decades, this was no surprise. Climate change, COVID, it's having the same effect of just opening up that big wound between rich and poor, have and have not. People like me and you, Ahmed, who can, who can self-isolate and continue working and continue getting paid. But for many people, frontline workers who are the frontline workers what do they look like they are largely low income and the people of color who are exposing themselves the uber drivers who don't want to be driving but 
they need to get the money. I mean, so <clears throat> this COVID crisis has cruelly inexposed and shown us what many of us knew already. The other side, as urban planners, there is real room for optimism, horrible though this situation is, because people are rediscovering public spaces, cycling, walking, physically distanced walking groups. Uh, people are discovering that the roads aren't as congested. Some cities are trying to mainstream this new public interest in public space. So, you know, what one hand takes away, the other hand gives. We're getting, as urban planners, I think we have one of the best opportunities to show people, you know, what urban planning can truly be as a result of people's new de newfound desire for public space, for, for recreation, etc. cetera. Uh, Alison uh, Lala is asking, um, uh, do, do you have opinions on the reliance on indicators to measure urban sustainability? And do you think a focus on measurable outcomes is determinant, de to uh, or helpful to achieve just sustainability? Um, that's a that's a great question, Alison. And and no, I, you know, some other people would say, well, Julian, you know, your you know your work is very qualitative. I mean, you know, what about some 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 quantitative data? I, I throw that in because the walkability concept has risen to the top. It seems to me, in terms of, you know, if there were one measure you could have of urban sustainability, what would it be? Well, it would be walkability. Um, and interestingly, we can look at the data, um, you know, the scores from 0 to 100 um, that Walk Score gives us, or you can do as one of my students has just done a brilliant thesis, which uh, is like your SRP, your uh, supervised oh, wow. project. Yeah. Um, and she has looked at walkability from a racial point of view and found that really the measure is a very incomplete measure and it really suits uh, safe white neighborhoods rather than uh, neighborhoods where policing issues exist or where um, unsafety kind of issues exist. So, so uh, she, uh, for her thesis, she did a series of six podcasts where she walked places with different people and really got an idea that walkability is a very relative concept and that the walk score app really um, doesn't take into account many of these relativities, if you like. So yes, Alison, um, I am wary of um, some of the commonly uh, used uh, urban sustainability metrics, but I think, you know, if we want to illustrate the points that I'm making about injustice, then we can use walkability because it, it, it shows basically that those neighborhoods that are more walkable are also whiter. And one of those books that I showed you um, when I was talking about greenlining and gentrification, uh, one of those books actually talks about how, you know, greenlining is you know, absolutely correlated with increasing whiteness in neighborhoods. So I, I use it in, in that sense, yeah. But speaking of green lining, um, uh, Samantha Carr, who's uh, one of the undergrad in the class, she's asking, how can we mitigate the negative impact of green lining? We have to change, as planners, we have to change. We have to impose something better. Yeah. So how can we control that? Well, you know, I mean, so, Again, the, the wider problem here we have is gentrification. And the great geographer David Harvey said, we're building cities for people to invest in, not to live in. And this is a problem. You only have to look at Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal less so, but Boston, London. We're building cities as investment hubs, and then half the condos are empty. Um, so that's problem number one is that all of the incentives in cities are for buying and buying in green neighborhoods but that so uh, some urban planners though are doing quite some quite interesting work um dan immergluck at um georgia tech is looking at the atlanta beltline and his conclusion is we need robust 
housing affordability policies and strategies in place before we embark on these urban greening projects. Okay. Um, Dan Trudeau at McAllister College in, um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, is working on this concept of what he calls patient capital, that much of these urban investments are international capital driven. We don't know where that's coming from um, and it wants a quick return. Can we get stocks of patient capital, capital that is going to hang around in communities and stay, but keep those communities stable rather than looking for a quick return with cash buyers in and out, etc. There's also the concept of just green enough. Um, this concept says when we're doing neighborhood greening, let's not go full green, let's just do a public health cleanup. And this has come from working class communities in, 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 um, in Brooklyn, actually, who've said, look, if we do the full green thing, the complete streets, we're going to be out of this neighborhood in years. Let's just clean up the streets uh, to public health kind of standards, which are below sort of super duper greening standards because if we do the super duper greening we're going to get the coffee shops we're going to get the whole foods we're going to get all of that and we just don't want to so there's that and then there's community land trusts um, so there's many 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 strategies anti-gentrification strategies but i'm afraid until we change the calculus from cities for people to invest in to places for people to live in then you know we are going to see cities as investment hubs and increasing numbers of people not able to belong? Uh, here, here's a loaded question. So <laughs> Margaret uh, Ovener is asking, uh, I'm going to read the last part, which is the loaded one. So how can we foster a professional ethics that emphasizes justice sustainability when the field itself has in many ways a racist uh, classist history yeah great question i mean look i go back to my point urban planning is the spatial toolkit for uh, you know imagining and maintaining um white supremacy it absolutely is um you know if you look at it in the united states especially maybe less so in canada and certainly less so in the uk um urban planning has been used to segregate and let's remember that the original public health idea behind zoning was to separate uh, people from harm, not to separate people from each other. Um, it was the in the US that we really perfected that and developed a system, as I said, second only to uh, apartheid South Africa. But we can change it. Um, and progressive cities are starting to change it. We're going to have uh, an election in Boston, and I'm hoping, and I'm actually actively involved in this, and I'm tenured so I can say this, but we have the chance of electing our first woman of colour as, um, uh, as mayor of Boston. I've been helping her with her food justice agenda. I have never seen a food justice agenda produced by a non-profit or a government uh, department that recognizes, as she does, how the food system is, uh, you know, is, is maintaining white supremacy. I mean, you know, it was uh, black slaves first in the food system, and now it's basically Latinx people who are, uh, you know, maintaining a precarious situation. She's got a policy on uh, sanctuary cities. She has a Green New Deal for Boston. We're seeing, I think, a lot of these new uh, emerging younger leaders, often women of colour, and they're aligned very much with the AOC, um, Ayanna Presley, you know, the Gang of Four, as President Trump likes to call them. These are progressives. Now, if Michelle Wu gets elected to Boston, she will be, um, she will reweave the narrative of Boston. She has an analysis. I mean, her food justice policy says, you know, food justice is racial justice. Food justice is about decentering the white supremacists. I mean, she has the language and she has the support, quite frankly. So um, I think it's hard for, and, and I have this conversation with my students, it's really hard for people like yourselves to walk out and go and be radicals in a system that 
is absolutely gamed against you. But, you know, when we do get these new leaders who really understand uh, the need for deep structural change, that's the kind of place that I think you guys should be working for. Um, now, you know, I know there was a lot of excitement when Valérie Laplante uh, became mayor of um, Montreal and, and from my contacts in Montreal, she seems to be doing a, a decent job, but, you know, um, Councillor Wu, hopefully Mayor Wu next year, she has an analysis that is, you know, absolutely uh, spot on and it hits this uh, absolute need for, um, for recognition of the harms done stopping the harms and then imagining the stages by which we can come to some form of equity. It's all like, I have a lot of questions, but unfortunately <laughs> we have to wrap up and talking to you, I'm, I always enjoy it, always inspire us all. Thank you so much, Julian. Thanks for taking the time and, and oh. hopefully we'll, we'll plan more to bring you back to inspire the students and, and, and give us a bigger reading list <laughs> my so, pleasure, yeah, David, my pleasure, pleasure. Yeah. and uh, yeah yeah hopefully you won't have such a cold winter this year my winter in montreal was um, yeah something <laughs> else <laughs> thank you so much yeah take care much appreciated bye, Good bye. Talk. bye, -bye.